Tomorrow, oh. President Obama finally sending his budget to Congress. That will make the president's budget more than two months late. So is it better late than never, or is it already dead on arrival? We spoke with Republican Senator Rand Paul a short time ago. Senator, nice to see you, sir. Glad to be here. Tomorrow, the president is going to deliver his budget to Capitol Hill. Um, better late than never, I assume you think? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I have a lot of confidence that it'll do much good for the country. I think his ideas for making the country better are raising taxes, adding new regulations to the economy, and I disagree with both. Uh, change CPI, which apparently is annoying uh, the base in his party that he is apparently in his budget conceding to it or agreeing to it, I should even say that. Um, is that something that you see as an olive branch by the president to the Republicans? You know, I think uh, senior citizens are squeezed, and they're squeezed because their check stays the same and their prices rise. Can you squeeze some money out of seniors by doing all these manipulations to the CPI? You might be able to, but why don't we get an economy that grows and not everybody's so squeezed? You know, we're growing at less than 1% on average for the last four years. The last quarter, we actually were shrinking. The jobs report last week was abysmal. So really, what we need is a Reagan-esque type of recovery and we're not getting it. What would you do? What I would do is that there are things you have to do demographically to Social Security to make it sound, but what I would do to make the economy grow is I would have an enormous tax cut. I wouldn't piddle around with revenue neutral. I think Republicans' mistake have been, oh, we'll cut your taxes and we'll raise my taxes or vice versa. We'll shift the tax burden around. The president plays some of that game also. What I would do is I would shift money from Washington to the private sector in an enormous way. I would have a 17% flat income tax for corporations and for business. Everybody pays the same. There'd be very few deductions, but there'd be an enormous amount of money infused into the private economy. And when Reagan cut taxes, we had 8 million jobs created. The way as big as our economy now is, I think you'd have 11, 12 million jobs created. All right, well, we then wouldn't have the revenue into the federal mm -hmm. treasury to, to finance uh, a lot of parts of the government. I'm curious that with money being so, I mean, money's cheap right now. The interest rates are so low. Why aren't the businesses borrowing that money and revving up the economy that way rather than looking to have the revenue, the added revenue by having their income tax go down? Well, uh, there's a good book Amity Slays wrote a, few, a year or two ago called The Forgotten Man, and in there she talks about FDR. One of the things she says about FDR is businesses were terrified of him. I think it's the exact same scenario now. Businesses are terrified of this president. They're terrified of what new regulations will come, what the EPA will promulgate, what new taxes will come, what government will do to them next. And so I think businesses are sitting on the sidelines and they're worried about what government will do to them next. What do you think is going to happen? President's budget will come to Capitol Hill that probably the Democratic yeah. Senate will embrace it and not be totally happy with it. But uh, take me through the scenario you predict. You know, I'm not sure really there is a reconciliation because we're so far apart. The Republicans passed a budget that doesn't raise taxes. The Democrats passed a budget that raises taxes a trillion and a half. You know, what are we going to do, split the difference there? I'm not for raising $750 billion worth of taxes. I'm not for raising taxes. You just heard me. I'm for cutting taxes. I think you stimulate the economy by leaving more money in the hands of those who earn it. They make wiser decisions. Friedman always made the statement. He said, nobody spends someone else's money as wisely as they spend their own. That's why you want to leave money with those who earn it. They spend it, but more wisely. If there's no reconciliation, that means we get more continuing resolutions, kick the can down the, the on the road further. I mean, we're never going to get any resolution. Well, one of the things we could do is we could have individual appropriations bills. I think there's essentially 12 appropriations bills that run and fund government. Why don't we do them individually and vote on them one at a time? I'm a big believer that part of the reason we have such an impasse in Washington is everything's stuck together and we have to agree on a thousand things. You and I might not agree on a thousand things, but we might agree on ten. Let's put the ten things we agree, or let's put one appropriation bill out and pass the appropriations for defense. Let's pass the appropriations for veterans affairs. Let's pass the appropriations for all of the departments individually instead of doing it as a continuing resolution, which is a mess and we never get anything fixed. All right, tomorrow you're giving a speech at Howard University, African American, predominantly university here in Washington. Um, why are you going there? 
Because I think the Republican Party needs to expand. We need to compete for every vote. I think for too long we haven't been showing up to African American audiences. My staff told me I might be the first uh, Republican to go there since Colin Powell in the 1990s. Uh, that means we're not showing up. We got to show up in all venues and ask people for their vote. And I used to think this was kind of corny. I'm a physician. When I ran for office, I thought you just told people what you were for and they might vote for you. People say, no, you got to ask them for their vote. And I think symbolically there's some truth to that. You have to show up to an African-American college, a historically black college, and you have to ask them for their vote. For the Republican Party or for me or whoever it's for, you have to ask them for their vote and you have to talk about issues that might appeal to them. And I think there's a lot of things that I believe in that also have crossover appeal to people who have been voting for the Democrat Party. I suspect they might want to hear about the fact that there's unemployment rate for African Americans about 13.3 percent, which right. is deplorable. Um, and so the opp opportunities seem to be much less for African Americans compared to the uh, uh, white uh, unemployment rate, which is well below the national average. You're stealing my stuff, Greta. That's <laughs> going to be in my speech tomorrow. The African American rate of unemployment is twice the average. Unfortunately, it's been that way for a long time, but it hasn't gotten any better under this president. One in six people are living in poverty. We have made uh, and ruined the lives of a lot of young, not only African Americans, but whites, but young people in general, by putting them in jail for nonviolent drug crimes. We have a foreign policy, I think, that needs to be something that is more appealing to a broad section of people, not just African Americans, but young people, independents, Democrats. And I think that foreign policy should be one that we believe in a strong defense, but it doesn't have to be an overly aggressive foreign policy. Well, I'm anxious to hear your speech tomorrow. Um, good luck, Senator. Thank you. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you.